Good morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. I hope you uh, moved your clocks forward one hour as you remember that it's daylight saving time change this weekend and that uh, you may or may not be up at the right time, but that's okay. Uh, at least you can get it set today before tomorrow, before Monday hits. And so uh, what a beautiful weekend we had. It started a little rocky on Friday, uh, quite a bit of wind, but uh, it has been nice. The temperature is a little chilly in the mornings, but it's uh, gotten warmer through the day. As we start our lesson today, we'll finish up our series as being called, uh, and I uh, hope over the last few weeks you've understood some things that God has planned for many people in the Old and New Testament and his examples that they had for us uh, when they were called that may apply to us today. And God still calls people for his service. We will finish our study today. I'm not real sure exactly what we're going to start next week, but I'll send out an email before next week starts. Just remember as we start our lesson today, as we open with a word of prayer, those who are having issues in their lives and uh, for the people in your in the war in Ukraine, and, and I don't know how many people are involved that uh, may not even live in that country, but I'm sure there's a lot of other people that uh, are being, um, have family or friends or variety of other things, and it affects all of us in one way or another. And just pray that God's Spirit today will speak to you through this lesson as we study His Word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you again and study your Word, and just pray today that your Holy Spirit will speak to each heart who listens to this message, that you will, you know their lives, and you know things that are going on. And I just pray, Father, that you will be near and dear to them, and just help them understand things that uh, happen for a reason. You have a plan for all of us. And as people have learned throughout history, when you have called them for service and they followed you and and have uh, been obedient, I just pray that we will continue to do the same today. Thank you for your words. It gives us truth and insight. And I pray these words will be used for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. But our overall series has been called in the New Testament, and the lessons for this uh, quarter has focused on God's calling of individuals to specific ministries according to his plan, and those have included in the in the first section even John the Baptist and the Magi in the birth of Jesus, and then in the second section, Jesus, the parents, and the disciples as they were called, and most importantly, Jesus himself. And then uh, the last section, the call of women, uh, is the final focus on call in the New Testament and women who were called to vocations of service uh, to God's people. The New Testament sees a broad calling of all people to salvation and a narrower calling of certain individuals to specific ministries, even in the church back then, as well as today, as we've talked about. And our last section is the call of women, as we've talked about. The five lessons of this uh, quarter's final unit look at faith, examples of faithful women in the first century church. All three of today's lesson text from the author of Luke analyze uh, uh, an analysis of his two books, Luke and Acts, show that Jesus had special regard for women while he was here on this earth. And in Luke 7, verses 11 through 15, Luke records, Now it happened the day after that he, that talking about Jesus, went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, beheld a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Jesus had a special calling for women and a special concern for many of them, even though they may not have been called into service He helped them in many of their lives and many of their personal issues. We can name several women who he healed for a variety of things. But this next 
text, this text and others offer an opportunity to celebrate stories that are sometimes overlooked. These women, whether named or not, played an important role in the ministry of Jesus that continued into the church. The Jews of Luke's day lived not only in Palestine, but also in enclaves of Greek and Roman cities throughout the empire. Jews maintained their own practice regarding women's roles as directed by their understanding of scripture and of family structure from ancient times. In general, a Jewish female was attached to a man who served as her provider, protector, and authority. Normally, it was a father who held this role for a daughter, and then if they got married, that role changed to their husband. Jewish communities experienced varying degrees of influence from Greek and Roman cultures, and as the Roman Empire expanded, Romans brought their tradition to their conquered peoples. Roman society was dominated by men at all levels, in business, politics, government, and military. But some women gained influence by their association with powerful men. In particular, some wives of the emperor achieved notoriety and celebrity. Sometimes mothers, wives, or sisters would even appear on the coinage of an empire or an emperor. Even so, relations within families varied in pagan cultures. Some husbands loved and respected their wives and saw them as equal partners in life. Other men had little affection for their wives and might abuse or ignore them with few consequences from society outside the home. The prominence of even a few women in the New Testament accounts is there for both surprising sometimes and instructive as well. It gives us examples to follow. Our last study of our last series is entitled Call to Prophesy. Now that is spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y. S-Y. We know another word called prophecy, which is P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y. These are two words that have two different meanings. And I hope you may understand the difference of those two words and their meanings, but you may not. We're going to talk about them now. Prophesy, or I try to emphasize the S-Y, it, the meaning is in the Bible is to speak for God. That's P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y. In the Bible is to speak for God. Paul points this out in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 4, when he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. That's S-E-S-Y. Verse 2, he goes on, For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies, that's E-S-Y, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. And in verse 4, he concludes, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. He has a couple more things to say after that, but we'll stop right there. Now the word prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, is defined as a message from God. Peter points this out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, when he says, And so we have the prophetic, that's P-R-O-P-H-E-C, but in T-I-C, word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Verse 20, know this first, that no prophecy, E-C-Y, of scripture is of any private interpretation. But prophecy, E-C-Y, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So God gave a prophecy to men when they either spoke and or wrote it down. But today our lesson's entitled Prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y, and we're going to focus on that throughout our final study. We'll break it down into three sections and we'll see examples of prophecy uh, that is described throughout Scripture. The first one is in the temple, 
in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. The next scripture passage is in Jerusalem in Acts 2, verses 16 through 21. And the last one is in a city called Caesarea in Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. Our first section in the temple, Luke 2, verses 36 through 38. When Jesus was eight days old, Mary and Joseph took him to Jerusalem to the temple to consecrate him as required by scripture. And in the temple courts, the, the, the little family encountered two people who were waiting for the Messiah. One was a widow named Anna. And that's where our passage starts today in verse 36. Now, there was one, Anna, a prophetess, a, a pro, a prophetess <laughs> the daughter of Phanuli of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Anna is a Greek form of the name Hannah, which was the mother of the prophet Samuel. And a prophet is someone chosen by God to speak for him as he brings something to mind. In the Old Testament, it identifies four women as being prophetesses, uh, Miriam in Exodus 15, Deborah in Judges 4, Huldah in 2 Kings 22, and the unnamed wife of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 8. Though their words are not recorded in length, such as like Moses or Jeremiah, uh, these women served in the same ways by communicating what God revealed to them for the people to hear. Now, the mention of Anna's father, Fanuli, suggests that he was a well-known resident of Jerusalem, as Luke wrote, this account. Uh, Fanuli means face of God or presence of God. This implies his religious um, dedication, a faithfulness that was passed down to his daughter. Fittingly, his daughter would see God face to face when she met the baby Jesus. Now, as that verse implies, they were of the tribe of Asher, which was one of the northern tribes destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. And we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago. Though many were taken in captivity at that time, others were left behind and some became the people, as we talked about earlier, known as the Samaritans through intermarriage with non-Israelites. Now, Anna's family apparently was left in the land but not did not intermarry with other peoples as they were recognized as being from the tribe of Asher. As we continue talking about Anna in verse 37, it says, And this woman was a widow for about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Rather than find a new husband, Anna devoted herself to, special, to spiritual service within the temple. She fasted and prayed. Now, Paul gives a description of such a woman, when he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, when he says, But if any widow, widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before the Lord. Now, verse 5 talks about a widow with nothing when it says, Now she who is really a widow and lay, left alone, trust in God and continues in supplications and prayers day and night. And that is what Anna did when her husband passed away. Now, widows may attract uh, unusual blessings and contribute powerfully to aspects of congregational service by doing what Anna did in these verses that we're talking about. And it continues in the final verse of this first section. And, con and coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Anna was looking for the Messiah. And she was in the temple many days, fasting and praying. But as the end of that verse says, talks about redemption, recognizing redemption to be at hand was a fulfillment of prophecy, as spelled out in Isaiah 52, 9, when it says, Burst into song of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. However, what is meant... Uh, precisely by redemption of Jerusalem is may not be totally clear because to redeem means to buy back or deliver from danger. 
But at that time, Anna could, like many others, have national politics in mind because redemption would mean that Judah would be uh, its own sovereign nation again. That would have had special appeal because Anna was old enough to remember when Rome became the official power in Judah. Memories of life before Rome were enticing, even if those times were less than peaceful. Or she could have had the more spiritual redemption from sins in mind. But God sees fit to use whatever faithful understanding we have to witness to others, just as Anna witnessed to Mary and Joseph that day in the temple. And the Spirit did not fill in any incomplete understanding that Anna may not have had regarding Jesus' role. Remember last week when we talked about Apollo preached about Jesus the Messiah. However, he did not know and understand about the Holy Spirit at that time. And Aquila and Priscilla filled him in. Anna may not at this time understand the full story of what would happen. However, she did understand who Jesus was. He was the Messiah sent by God. Now, in the, in the study we had last week and this week, this can be a comfort to us as we talked about last week, as each of us know only in part and we prophesy in part as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 9. We don't understand a lot of things even in our own time today, even though we've had many years to go by and many people who have learned a few things, we're still learning many things in God's scripture. Now, Simeon, which was the other person that was waiting for Jesus in the temple, identifies God's salvation as being personified in Jesus. For Jesus to come was for God's salvation to come. The testimony of Anna, this pious woman, complements Simeon's testimony. Both men and women observe God's work early in Jesus' life. Anna's work as a prophetess in the temple court suggests that she addressed all who would listen to her. What a powerful testimony. Our next section talks about uh, in, the, in Jerusalem as we continue with call to prophesy in Acts chapter 2 verses 16 through 21. And on Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, the Holy Spirit descended in spectacular fashion. We talked about this briefly last week. This dramatic event drew a diverse crowd as an audience for Peter. It was an ideal setting to explain the significance of the death and resurrection of Christ, as we, we know, the good news of the gospel. Now, what I'd like to do is read all of these verses uh, in the beginning, and then we can look at them verse by verse, because it tells the, we need to understand the full impact of these uh, five or six verses. Acts chapter 2, verses 16 21. Verse 16 says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. That's E S Y. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And verse 21 concludes, And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As we look at each verse, verse 16 uh, this was spoken by the prophet, and Peter's quotation is spoken by the prophet that comes from Joel, uh, the prophet, in, in the book written in Joel in the Minor Prophets in chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And verse 17 and 18, And it shall come to pass in the last days, said the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, that's E-S-Y, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and my maid servants I shall pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Now the prophet Joel had foreseen the day of the Lord centuries earlier. That day would be a time when God would intervene dramatically in the history of Judah and of, excuse me of Israel, according to Joel chapter two verse one. The last days refers to the beginning of the final era in God's plan for humanity. 
We have been in those last days for some 2,000 years now. A widespread distribution of God's Spirit would be a sign that the new era had dawned, talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. The inclusion of Gentiles was anticipated by the phrase, all people. Joel in inclusively spec uh, specified both genders and the spectrum of age groups as conduits for God's communication. Those whom society and, and culture previously viewed as being ineligible to speak on behalf of God will be empowered to do so just that, as he points out in verses 19 through 20. We are all called, men, women, old, young, to prophesy, preaching, basically, or spreading God's word. As we continue in verse 19 and 20, uh, remind you where it says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The specific wonders and signs noted here did not occur on the day of Pentecost. Even so, there were supernatural signs and visible phenomena that accompanied the coming of the Holy Spirit. We talked briefly about that last week, but let's look at it again in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, when it says, And suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a mighty, uh, rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they sat. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. This verse speaks of the prophecy uh, of, of the Spirit coming, but not necessarily. Uh, it talks about the second coming of Christ when it talks about the moon and the sun being changed and some of the other things. Because Luke records in Luke chapter 1, verses 25 and 28, some of the same things when he records what Jesus said. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and on the earth, distresses of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. In verse 26, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectations of those which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your head because your redemption draws near. As Luke kind of, as Jesus records the things and the signs of things to come, I think uh, it was uh, P uh, P Peter also said some of those things in the day of Pentecost. But those particular signs didn't happen then, but they were yet to come. As we conclude this section in verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter himself, I don't think, did not at this point fully understand the sweeping nature of the word everyone as his growing understanding in Acts chapter 10 and 11 helps point that out. Now the events of the day of Pentecost was not primarily about the miraculous gifting of the Holy Spirit or about the inclusion of both genders in prophetic ministry. The scope of salvation is more than welcoming men and women equally and much more than the ability to prophesy. Rather, the primary issue is the announcement of salvation to all who call on the name of the Lord. Paul points this also out in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 13, or 9 through 13, a very familiar passage that we see from time to time and hear quite often. Verse 9 says that if we confess with our, your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Uh, in verse 12, for there is no difference between Jews or Greeks, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him. And he concludes in verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved as it was recorded also in Acts chapter 2 at the end of verse 21. Now during this passage, women were there during the day of Pentecost and heard these words as well and accepted and obeyed God's calling. We talked briefly about that uh, here a couple of weeks ago when we talked about some of the women, Mary Magdalene and some of the others that were there after Jesus' resurrection 
that were probably still there during this message as well on the day of Pentecost. And we also talked about last week how many of them had taken the message, men and women, to various parts of the Roman Empire, as we talked about how maybe possibly Priscilla and Aquila had accepted Christ as Savior back then. Our final section, uh, as we talk about the call to prophesy, is, is in, founded in the city of Caesarea, and we'll look at it in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Now, the events in the following brief account occurred near the end of Paul's third missionary uh, journey in about A.D. 58. More than two decades had passed since the day of Pentecost. And at the point where we join the narrative, Paul and his companion, companions were nearing the end of their multi-stop sea voyage on this third missionary journey. And he starts in verse 8 of Acts uh, chapter 21. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Luke, the author of this narrative, was a traveling companion of Paul and was with him at this time of the incident. This is, the, and this is indicated by the, the use of the word we. And in reading of the arrival of Paul's company to Caesarea, we take care to observe that this is the coastal city of Caesarea Maritima, not the inland town of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Maritima served as a Roman administrative center and military headquarters. It was about 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem, and this city figures prominently in the book of Acts. Now, as we continue to look at verse 8, Philip the Evangelist, not to be confused with the Apostle Philip, lived in Caesarea. He is one of the seven that they called to be, as we would, might call them, deacons today, and known to be of the full of the spirit and wisdom chosen for the ministry described in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He later crossed cultural boundaries to preach the gospel to Samaritans in Acts 8. And then, if you remember the story, he was to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch, also in chapter 8. Now, Philip's home became a way station for Paul as he journeyed to Jerusalem for the final time. It continues in verse 9, talking about Philip and his family. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied at E-S-Y or I-E-D. The description of Philip's four daughters as unmarried indicates their status as virgins. The question is kind of interesting. Why do you think Luke wrote this verse identifying the daughters as virgins? Well, Paul gives maybe one answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 34 through 35, not specifically about these four, but about, but about virgins in particular. When Paul writes in verse 34, there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman, the unmarried woman cares about the things of God that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Verse 35, And this I say to you for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. The four daughters who prophesied and their evangelist father were well, likely well known to Luke's readers, and were celebrated as servants among Christians in that area. Although this is a reasonable conclusion, nothing further is recorded of Philip and his daughters. And as we start our close for today, we looked at an aged widow, a group of women who had followed Jesus and remained in Jerusalem after his ascension, and now a band of four unmarried sisters. The New Testament offers these as examples of first century women who were empowered with the gift of prophecy, prophesy, P-R-O-H-P-H-E-S-Y. I'll get it right. The focus is rather on using one's giftedness in answering God's call to ministry. As one observer put it, 
When the church is working properly, every woman as well as every man will be using at least one spiritual gift in ministry to others in the body of Christ. Which kind of is goes along with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As we ponder how God calls people to ministry today, we can take note, we can note means and methods in both the Old and New Testament. Some calls were very startling and direct. Other calls were via specifically directed actions of intermediaries. And that leads to the question of how to recognize calls of God today. As mentioned, the calls may and probably will be different for each individual. Prayer, counseling, and more prayer can help us understand God's calling for our lives. God isn't interested in perfection. His interest is in willingness. And few of us will preach to massive crowds or build a megachurch. But through his spirit, God recruits people for amazing assignments nonetheless. One final thought to remember. God gives people for ministry according to his will and plan and not ours. What is God calling you to do today? Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these words that you have given us today to think about and the examples that we've talked about throughout this series. And I pray, Father, that we will listen to your spirit as you speak to each and every one of us. You have a plan for us. And I pray today, Father, that we will follow your plan, be obedient, and to serve you in the way you have directed us. Lord, we don't all have the same talents. You've given us different talents, and I pray we'll use them for your honor and glory. And pray that those who have listened to this series, Father, will look to you for guidance as well. Lord, we trust in you. We just thank you for salvation through Jesus. And just pray, Father, that as we go through our life day by day, we will follow your direction as the Holy Spirit leads us in all ways. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you enjoy your beautiful Sunday, and we will talk to you next week. Have a blessed week.